Hello everyone and Fulcha Arash to the Airvision podcast. We are here with the fantastic guest today in the podcast studios in Dublin City Centre. He is a brilliant singer-songwriter, performer and probably best known to our listeners as a fantastic Irish Eurovision artist. Please welcome Ryan O'Shocknessy. Welcome. <laughs> How are you? I'm great, yeah. Thanks very much, yeah. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too. What have you been up to of late? Just relaxing. Drinking some beers, eating some turkey, you know, enjoying the Christmas. So, um, yeah, it's been a really nice kind of chill, relaxed time for me over the last few weeks. So, yeah. The good stuff. Yeah. Uh, Connor and I met you back in April in the embassy. <laughs> we feel very yeah. posh when we, we say very, that. We were very posh that night. Very we were very like Champagne flutes. Long mm-hmm. glasses. The glad the bags on. Yeah. The works. You were telling us like you were up to a lot of cycling and charity work and stuff like that of late. Yeah. So when was that? That must have been April. in around April. End of April. Yeah. 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 So at that time I was organising the trip that I do annually to... Le Hinch, well, we did it backwards this year. So we actually did Galway to Dublin this year just to mix it up. But over the last three years, we've raised like 50 grand for wow. Scary's Youth Support Services. So they provide early intervention counselling for kids that, you know, just need to talk to someone. So it's like a free service. And they've branched out from just not Scary's now, but like North County Dublin. And they've stretched the age group up to 25 instead of like 20. So, um, yeah, they've. I think they've got maybe... 10 or 12 people within the therapy process um, at any given time. So, you know, that's a really, that's and it's a fun trip because it's a good excuse to get all like your mates together and just cycle across the country and have a bit of crack. So it's a win-win. That's amazing. So that's, that's what I was doing in, I think we did it this year in like at the start of May. Um, so yeah, it was really fun, but it was like hard to train for. You're doing... 160 kilometers the first day and then 120 or something the second day to get across the country so maybe i can rope you into it for next year <laughs> yeah <laughs> we need to start training start now. training now <laughs> yeah, start yeah. training about three weeks ago yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we first met you back in 2012 when you were on the voice of ireland and britain's got talent um can you talk us through that experience what was that like um yeah i was actually only talking to someone about this the other day and it's funny I was in a bar the other night, my friend was playing and he got me up to do a song and someone said to me afterwards, oh, you're you, you're the guy who was on Britain's Got Talent and I, I forget sometimes that like people know me, you know, from, from doing that and um, at the time, like I was telling them at the time, I really felt like I could do well in it. There was like this positivity within me that I was like, if I can get on that show, like onto Britain's Got Talent, if I can get onto that and I can get like a YouTube clip maybe people might see me on a YouTube clip. And like the way Susan Boyle's clip went viral, I think that was like the start of things yeah. kind of mm-hmm. going viral and stuff. So that was my goal. I just set that goal of like, right, I'll get onto the stage and I'll hopefully have like a YouTube clip. And it worked out. So I didn't really know what to do after that. I just kind of went with the, the like rolled with it after yeah. that. And it's all it's all like looking back at it now, it feels like a different life. It feels like um, a different lifetime. But, um, but the process was, it was intense. Um, it was I wasn't prepared for it I was really nervous and I didn't I wasn't prepared for people knowing me on a scale that they did and like recognising me on the streets and stuff like that it was all very kind of intrusive at times Um, and yeah I think as I said like I I wasn't really emotionally prepared for it or like I was young I was 19 Mm. um, still very naive to the world so um, but yeah it, it kind of it grew wings and I got signed then with Sony and I was able to do a record with them. I learned so much about the industry within the first kind of year of doing that. And here I am today talking to you guys on the podcast. And like, so everything, everything rolls on from, yeah. from one to the next. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of my process with that. It must have been a crazy time because, you know, back in 2012, it was kind of the height of talent shows yeah. and mm. millions and millions of people watching these shows and to go on, like you said, 19 years old. And you also performed your own song in your mm. audition phase as well. So, so that, um, was, that, that was, must have been yeah, that was mental. The, the idea I had was I hadn't seen anyone perform their own song, but you hear people going on saying, oh, I'm a songwriter. Mm-hmm. And, but I think they weren't allowing people to like because covers were just, you know, more attractive, I think, to the viewer. And I remember on The Voice, they wouldn't let me play my own song on The Voice. And that's why I was like, well, maybe Britain's Got Talent will. And it was in around the same time. And they did. 
Um, and that was a gamble for them, I think, because no one had really done it. And uh, and it played out, played out well for them, played out well for me. Definitely. And you had a story with that song, I remember, mm. as well. Like, you were getting headlines. And as you said, the video was pretty viral. But I think storytelling is something we'll probably come back to with you because your Eurovision entry definitely tells a, a beautiful story. Of course, Eurovision runs in your family, mm. Ryan. So your uncle, Gary? Yeah was our entrant in 2001. Yes. Would that be your earliest memory of Eurovision or how yeah. how far back can we go? There, thereabouts. Um, yeah, I don't, I can't really recall much before that. I remember sitting in front of the telly and being allowed to stay up late from the age of like five or six. But when my uncle did it, my parents actually flew over to Copenhagen. So I think we were with my grandparents and there was a moxie load of us and we were all watching my uncle on the telly and we were like, this is, this is wild, you know? Um, and still to this day, like he does karaoke on <laughs> Christmas time. That's brilliant. Right. So he brings over his speaker and his microphone. We're all waiting for him to come. And he's usually the last one in. His family is usually the last one in. We're like, all right, here we go. Gary's here. Karaoke be getting on. So, um, so yeah, that was probably yeah, one of my earliest Eurovision memories. And did you kind of after that continue to grow and love Eurovision or did it kind of take a back seat until you decided to go and do it yourself I think it was my mom so my mom for years had like a dream of doing Eurovision so she, and my mom's a great singer and uh, but she never really had the opportunity or the different things like l- never really lined up for her to, to do it but it was always you know the way everyone has like a little underlying dream I'd love to do that you know mm. so I think I was always listening to her talking about that and yeah like singing rock and roll kids with her in the car and stuff like that you know growing up driving around um so it was always there for me. It was always like something like maybe I could do that at some stage. Um, and then when the opportunity came to write the song for Brendan Murray, so he was 2017, um, I got a brief in front of me from um, a publisher and I sat down with Laura Elizabeth Hughes and Mark Kaplis and we were like, all right, let's try and write a song for, for, Brian, or for Brendan. And at, by the end of the day, we were all like, whoa, that's like, that's probably a good song, you know, and Louis Walsh didn't want that song that year. So the next year comes around. And to be honest with you, in 2018, I was kind of like, I don't know what I'm doing now with my career. You know, I don't know where this is going for me personally. And I remember talking to my girlfriend at the time and we were walking around the Phoenix Park and we were just talking about it. I was like, maybe I'll try something else. Maybe I'm going to do move on and do something else, maybe with music or who knows, you know, but maybe it's time for me to, to make a change. And I get a call to say the song has been chosen for this year and we need to find a singer. And the first thing that was said to me is like, Ryan, would you do it? And seeing the lack of success of Irish acts for years, I thought, oh, I don't know. I don't know if this is for me. The song is good. I know that. Maybe we can find a singer. So I made some calls around and I was looking for people to, to that might be interested in doing it and might be interested in singing. And then after about a week, we realized that like we couldn't, there was no one really interested or people who might not have the same vocal range that Brendan had because it was written for Brendan. Like mm-hmm. that's why it's so, that's why mm. it's so high. And, um, so yeah, so I end up talking to a few of my my closest people in my life, and you know they they kind of advise me, Ryan, why not just give it a shot? So yeah, and then I suppose that that dream that my mom had and that I was that was kind of underlying there for me kind of came true, and I was able to to go and represent the country. So that's kind of how that happened. I'm so interested in Ryan's. Eurovision story but equally like as a side note like your mom like can we get your mom <laughs> to Eurovision at any point that like, would be I don't know if she'd do it now <laughs> but um, I'm invested maybe a duet now. a duet between you two yeah, yeah. Be lovely I like me and my mom like we do sound great together like we do we, we sound good we can harmonise we've got that like family synergy going on there so yeah who knows who knows I wouldn't rule it out anything can happen with Eurovision exactly <laughs> exactly but back to Eurovision of course Lisbon 2018, so many Irish fans, and I know us personally and so many people listening are so eternally grateful to you for your beautiful performance, beautiful song, and also on top of that, a great result. Mm. Our only qualification in in quite some time. Can you run us through the whole creative process of getting it ready for Lisbon? You had a beautiful music video. You kind of had a, a campaign going with it mm. when you were in Lisbon. How did all that come about? So when... 
I said to Michael, I said, okay, I'll do it. Um, but if I'm doing it, I want to make sure that I have the creative control because I, for other projects I've done, like I set up my own label and I've, I've, I've put out different songs and different music, but I, I really think there was an opportunity at Eurovision to not just make the song sound good and, but there's an opportunity to like put a positive message forward too. And I didn't really know what that was going to be at the time, but I just said to him like, leave it with me. If I do it though, I want to make sure that I'm not um, just like a, a toy for other people to decide what to do with. Mm. And as well, just from an artistic perspective, I just wanted to make sure that I that I stayed true to myself and that I wasn't um, trying like being something I wasn't. Mm -hmm. So um, I was actually on tour in the States with an Irish trad band with dancers and all that type of stuff. And I had meetings in the evening with Michael and different people just on Zoom or, or first thing in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, I'd have to wake up and, and do this in a hotel in back hours of nowhere, <laughs> Kansas or wherever it was. Um, and the whole thing came about with the with the cake. I remember being on a on a, a Zoom or a, can we can we add context to this? Okay. Just in case. <laughs> Do you mind if I read out one of your tweets? Yeah, no okay. no problem. So just context for the cake, because this could mean many things. Ryan, you tweeted in May basically your feelings about the delegation and mm. our result. Um, you said in 2018, when I qualified with the song together, I stepped in as creative director after refusing to emerge from an exploding cake and pushed hard to have two male dancers on stage with me, which was a hard sell at the time. So you're referring to a meeting about the cake. Yes. We're so curious about this. Yeah. <laughs> so so um, with all due respect to Michael, it wasn't it wasn't his idea. And I think that tweet might have come across in the wrong way. So it wasn't mm. Michael's idea, but there was a creative director uh, hired by RTE to, you know, do the project. And I had a meeting with him and on, on Zoom and the whole time he's talking about, you know, so I'm thinking you come out on stage and there's like, you know, you, you don't know where you are, but then there's dancers around you. And next of all, like there's a cake and you come out of a cake. And this whole time I'm kind of sitting Jesus on the Zoom. And I, I didn't say anything the whole time. And then afterwards I called Michael and I said, come here. I said, I don't know if that guy even listened to the song. I don't think he understands like what the song is about. And and who knows what the what was really behind that. And it, it might have just been like a first shot in the dark idea. And maybe there was room for like changes and stuff. But I just said to Michael, can I write up a storyboard? Yeah. And then I, I can send it to you and see what you think. So that's exactly what I did. I sent it to him and he, got, and he went, yeah, well, you know, if, if you think this is good, then we'll go with that. But the first thing that needed to be done was the music video. And I remember sitting up late one night on tour with some of the other musicians and stuff like that. And I had an idea and I said, I don't think anyone's ever done this in Eurovision. Like, and it's such a gay event. I don't think anyone's ever had two same sex dancers having like a romance or like some sort of romantic interaction on stage I said I don't think it's it's been done which is really weird really yeah. strange to me a bit like the way in Britain's Got Talent no one had performed their own song you know that type of way so um, Christian Tierney the videographer I got onto him he loved the idea and I had Kieran Connolly as a choreographer and he got the two lads and this happens while I'm on tour mm -hmm. so I, I gave them the storyboard they did all the work and uh, the video was done and Michael had said, come here, we'll do it on the video and we'll see how that goes because if it doesn't go well, then we won't take it to stage. But of course, people saw it and they were impacted by it and Christian Tierney did an amazing job on that video as well. Beautiful yeah. video. He's, yeah, he's, video. he's great. He's always my go-to. He hates when I call him. I'm like, Christian, I want a video done. <laughs> he's like, Ryan, I do photographs these days. So, um, so that's kind of yeah that's kind of how that came about and when the video did well we said right let's just take it to stage this is like obviously people like it let's take it to stage and to be honest with you i always i liked the song i've always liked the song i still do but i think without the the project and the message that we were trying to send of love is love and Ireland are like a progressive country and we voted for same-sex marriage. I think without all of that, the, I don't think the song would have been strong enough to really get us to the, to the final.
if I'm honest, you know, because there's there was plenty of great songs that year, especially in in my semi final. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, it was uh, a really strong stacked. year. Stacked. It was a stacked. really, really that strong year. That particular semi-final, we had Fuego, we had Toy, like yeah. so many big, big songs. Yeah. Yeah. And songs that you still hear now being played on like RTE or like, you know, yeah. they That's still it. play them. So, um, so yeah, I think I really get invested in things. Like when I when I say I'm going to do it, I'm just like, right, this is, I, I eat, eat, breathe and sleep it. So, um, but yeah, I was really happy that the video did well. And that like this vision was able to to like travel the distance it did to the point where, you know, China had um, their rights were revoked for playing the the show um, or sorry, because they blurred out the, the pride yeah. flags. Yeah. So their rights were revoked on the day of the second semifinal, I think it was. And. Um, and then Russia, something happened with Russia as well, where they had like a something with their commentary or after our performance or something. Was to it? Do yeah, that. yeah. Like, I, I, I usually get this wrong. I, I, someone told me that they had like a day of remembrance or celebration for the, for the military or something on that day, and they didn't show my performance until after the watershed, which, oh. which also goes against Eurovision rules because yeah. it yeah. has to be shown live. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I like to think that there was with that message that we put forward and with the teamwork and everything that we, you know, put like a little like jab in the side of two superpowers. That's it. You know? yeah. And as well, you know, you've three minutes to make an impact. And like you said, you certainly did with, with that performance. And yeah. it was a performance that we'll remem- remember for years to come. Yeah. And uh, and it was a massive team effort, like a, a really, really big team effort. Um, and that team this that year, like we still have a great group chat, and it's like even this year is like Happy New Year and stuff being thrown into it. So it was a really good, really good team that year. You definitely saw when you qualified the the team. You know, yeah. everyone yeah. jumping up, everyone was happy. It wasn't a, a sole effort, and uh, yeah. it it probably took a lot because, like you said, it comes after years of unsuccessful you know entries at Eurovision and to have kind of the weight of the nation on your shoulder to yeah. finally get us into the final and I want to talk to you a bit about the odds because the odds were really interesting going into it we were 17 16th in the odds to qualify mm. and then after we qualify we shot up to third so what was yeah. that in the kind of space of those few days going on in your head like definitely like the ego took over a little bit and it was like we can do this mm-hmm. like oh my god we could win this you know and then it was really humbling and on the day of the final to like really be like, okay, like we did as the best we could, you mm-hmm. know, and like to really just accept that. But on the day of the semi-final, I remember sitting beside Mark Kaplis and because we were last to go through. Were we second last, last or last? Last. Or we were last. last. Yeah. yeah. We'll say it together. Yeah. What the yeah. Says. Ah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's say it together. Um and I you never, that never registered with me. <laughs> you gotta always think shaking. of that video as well of your man. I don't know if you've seen it, but it was the, oh, the yeah. guy really? reacting screaming. Yeah, He's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sitting at home on his couch. <laughs> yeah, thinking it was all done and then one brilliant. more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we were we were there and I remember turning to Mark Kaplis and being like I was like, oh no! I was like, we didn't, we didn't do it. And he grabbed my hand. He's like, Ryan, don't, don't like lose hope here. Don't lose hope. And I had, I had completely accepted defeat at that moment. And that, like, I'd say that would have been such, such a hard feeling, you know, if if we hadn't had got through. So for all the acts that have gone through and had to sit there through the semi final voting and for not to not have getting through like my heart goes out to them because mm-hmm. I yeah. I felt that for that few seconds of like oh my god this is it we didn't do our country proud and it was like it's not your own name you've got the country yeah. banner beside yeah. you and everything yeah, yeah. It's a different so that's, kind of pressure that's a weight like it's a weight on the shoulders um but yeah so we you know Cappy said to me no Ryan don't lose hope and you know we got through in the end so and the nation backed you all the way then after. Yeah. I, I lost a lot of my friends, a lot of money because, you know, they, <laughs> they were all, all jumped the in like as soon as we got through. That's some, a real Irish mentality, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Some of them still don't talk to me, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, the final then, what was that like, you know, to, to perform in the Eurovision final then and, you know, thinking, oh, we have a chance of, of winning? Yeah, I think like, I, I thought that we have a chance of winning, but also I was like, we've already won in a way like yeah. we, we've the message has been put across exactly um we've done Ireland proud in a way um 
and yeah we got through like that's my like in the Britain's Got Talent when I said right if I can get to the stage and get a video on YouTube I'm happy it was a bit like that with the with the Eurovision I was like if I can get through the semi-final I'm happy so I think we just enjoyed the the few days between the semi-final one and the final and yeah just kind of soaked it all in um, and there was definitely a feeling I remember after this because the rehearsal of the final is the judges the jury vote mm -hmm. and I remember Michael coming up after the the jury vote uh, uh, the rehearsal um, performance and he's like yeah it was it was good but like it wasn't great you know like that that's how I uh, the, the the vibe I got off him was like it wasn't it wasn't really that great and I remember not being able to hear myself very well and I actually don't watch back the final performance either because my voice definitely wasn't as good as I know it can be and there was something to do with the, the sound on stage because in the arena you have to have your in-ears mm -hmm. like really well tuned in order to to know how how you're singing and with the backing track and stuff so it's a little bit embarrassing when I watch back in it and I'm like a little bit out of key here and there but I think the the rehearsal performance was even worse so um so it was I kind of knew after the the rehearsal performance right maybe we didn't get a good jury vote so I was like let's just enjoy the rest of it so you know. still a great result I wouldn't even notice though as well you're talking no. about it. I thought it was beautiful but I think I'm said, always going to be my own worst critic as well I think yeah. that's yeah, of course. most people are but know. as you said with the teamwork element as well I always feel like with that particular entry like the dancers the pianists like you all came together to make a really beautiful performance when the two lads came over the bridge I always get goosebumps when yeah, I see yeah. it that kind of second verse and particularly when the snow comes in there was mm. just so many lovely moments mm. and I think Eurovision entries need a moment mm -hmm. don't they they can't just pass you by yeah know, like there's minutes. there's how many countries like 30 up to 40 up almost to 40. yeah so I think like, 43 in your years yeah so yeah. like it's if everyone needs to have something that people can remember or stand out um instead of just being like yeah just on stage do the thing but it need, you're right everything needs to have a moment um and if the song isn't doing that on a on a listener scale then it's got to be something visual you know mm -hmm. i i don't think i agree with people who think it has to be more about the the show more mm. about the the staging and stuff like that um because sometimes the song is just strong enough you know what i was listening to the night i was listening to like saudade the the portuguese oh, saudade. 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 Yeah. yeah like i can listen to that song like for days and never get bored and yeah. i know the staging was nice with the girls standing around but it was all about the song yeah and then the portuguese entry the year that it went to lisbon um oh, 2017 Jardim. Oh, the winner. The winner, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, um, Salvador. Salvador. Yeah. And, like, that's another standout moment for me as well. Yeah. And it's not... it. That was the song. That wasn't the staging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think if the song is strong enough, it can just be... It can be simplistic. But if the... But if it's not, it, then you need to add some sort of staging to try and, like, bring it up a it's notch. It's a fine balance. It's a fine balance. Yeah, yeah, definitely agree with you there. So you have a lot of great ideas in your head. What should Ireland do now? That's the what big question. What do you think Ireland should do now? <laughs> oh. Well, we have a two-part episode if you want to go back and listen. <laughs> <laughs> Plug that. I have, I have listened. <laughs> oh, God. Um, I'm a big believer in internal selection, personally. I just don't think most of our national selections here have done us many favours. I think we're more at risk of losing the better songs in that selection process. I think if people have a vision, it can be difficult to do it in that late, late studio, really. Mm -hmm. It can really hurt their chances. And also, I think there's a lot of faffing around in January with, like, you know, getting a video together in time for, say, the Euro song. It's a bit and, rushed. But, mm -hmm. like, use that time to finesse the video, release it in March if you're not ready, yeah. use the budget for your vision. That's sort of my feeling on it, personally. Yeah. And yeah. the song, as you said, it has to be the right song. Yeah, I, think, I I agree. I think the we can always build towards a national final, but ultimately, I think just focusing on getting the right song and the right artist is the main priority. Mm. Um, especially for you know a country which is in the pits with with Eurovision, um, instead of faffing around like you said with six songs or you know trying to piece together a national final that isn't up to standard versus everything else that's going on across Europe. 
um, just mm. focus on the song of the artist and that's that's all we can do and yeah. like you said do it as early as possible so you have that long run of PR mm. getting to the yeah. pre-parties talking to other countries doing PR in other countries as well um, I think that's the most important thing mm. and try and talk have a short list of about five artists on your list and approach each one of them and sell it like a business you know yeah. you might not win but winning isn't isn't mm. the you know the the big thing at the end you know mm. you can come 21st like Rosaline and have the biggest streaming song of Eurovision of all time you know yeah. so yeah, there's so yeah. many positives with Eurovision now and we see so it more and more on European tours like yeah. the amount of them yeah. coming to Dublin Daddy Fair has been here like three times yeah. now like yeah. there's so many possibilities for people with it but I imagine it's a hard sell to artists particularly in a country as small as Ireland yeah yeah, I I agree with everything you have said. Um, what is the kind of perception of Eurovision in the music community? You know, it's still not great. It's still like you know, you do Eurovision, it's kind of like oh, you're Eurovision acts now. So if there's more credible acts, you know, self built acts or whatever, uh, on a bill, and you're a Eurovision act, it might be a little bit more difficult to get on that bill. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just how it is. That's just the fact of the matter. I've had. Um, like you know, a couple of festivals say oh no we're booked out this year and then I've heard from other people that it was because I was on the Eurovision so for someone for well let's go back to um, you know what I think like we should do I think I agree with both of you I think it needs to be done a lot sooner mm-hmm. I think we should have a song already now for next year we should have an idea of what it's going to look like on stage what the message is what the project looks like, who's on the project, who's um, working on the team. And we should have a, a PR plan, a radio plug plan for Europe. And um, I do think that the staging availability on the Late Late Show is probably not, it's not great. So you don't really get to see what it's going to look like in Eurovision. Mm. And a lot of the time it's like it's just it doesn't come across as very appealing to watch or or to view and i think i th- i think like it's it's probably 90% of people think this maybe more maybe 95% of people so that should just be listened to in my opinion uh if we really do want to take it seriously and and do something positive to change what the cycle that we're in this like vicious cycle of of all right you know like you know euro show on on uh rte and then l- russian things coming up to the main event and yeah it just it, it hasn't worked so like we should be really be looking at maybe changing that that's simple mm-hmm. you know in my uh, opinion and like you said a lot of people would agree you know even people outside of ireland yeah well you know? like last year is embarrassing you know midway through the national final free peanut butter for the <laughs> audience like that goes viral on Twitter like look what Ireland are doing and that's the first image people think of then when they think of the actor mm. oh I remember watching that and it was peanut butter given away you know it's, but I'd say a lot of money goes into that too like I'm, yeah. not, I'm not sure how much but like even into the the Euro so what the, the national Euro song Euro, Euro song, the, yeah. the Euro song contest I'd say like a lot of money goes into that too and that money can just be used in other aspects like yeah. PR you know not RTE PR, but like uh, a good PR company outside of the the internal that can take the song and and do something with it and market it well around Europe. Because I don't think we've ever done that. No. <laughs> and we probably did in the 90s or something. But You seem to have a lot of the right contacts, even in terms of like being able to make your music video while you were in, t- in the country and that sort of thing. Do, do you think you had enough resources yourself from your own career to kind of help you build what you did in 2018 was there enough support from RTE or do you think there's like a lack of manpower in there I think like I think RTE is like a very old institution like it's 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 got people in there and I've I've been in RTE since I was like eight so I know these things because I've seen it and even when it comes to wardrobe or stuff like that it's, it's old fashioned so when I went into it I remember a lawyer that I was working with at the time said get your own stylist from outside of RTE and get your own videographer, your own, like do do everything outside. And um, and I think that paid off because uh, there's definitely resources in RTE, but do you really want it to be, do you want it to be modern? Do you want it to be 
a little bit different artistically or or like like that institutional idea um the the normal what what people in there might think is is the right way to go about things like an outside perspective is always a good idea i think especially when it comes to something like eurovision which is like global it's 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 a big thing mm. so yeah i think that's that's probably the way to go just and i and i had resources but i also used resources to get other resources to get people around you know so like the one or two people I did know was hey, were able to help me to get other people externally to come in. Mm-hmm. I think it's testament to you that you are such a creative individual and you know you have a vision for what your music wants to be you know to, to other people watching and listening and um, I, you know it worked out because we got to the final and that was your goal ultimately in the end. Um, what was it like post Eurovision then? You know the like you said it's obviously been a bit of a struggle with the perception of you being a Eurovision artist, even though you're much bigger than mm. that. Um, has that improved over time or is it still very much a hard sell? Um, I think that there's pros and cons to everything. And the pros are, I get enough work like from, from Eurovision gigs. So I'll go over to fly to Germany, fly to Amsterdam, like multiple times in the year. And I'll do these events and I get to meet all the different fans and... Uh, clubs and stuff I feel like I'm a part of the Eurovision family which is deadly it's like yeah. it's actually such a cool group of people everyone's so nice um, so I was in Liverpool for the last one there a few months back that was that was really good it was in October um, so I get enough work out of doing that and then a lot of the time because people in Ireland don't really follow Eurovision anymore people don't really know that I did it too so yeah, like the, you might get one or two people are like, oh yeah, because he was on the Eurovision, maybe that's not cool for us to you know have him on this bill or whatever. But no, the the pros definitely outweigh the cons. Um, but I will add that directly post Eurovision, it's all just over. So it's like you've worked your way months and months and months, getting four hours sleep a night and working all day every day to this goal, and then it's just like boom, it's over. And that for me was really hard. It was like really anticlimactic. Um, I just came home and was like, all right, so, you know, what's my next thing? Like, what's my next project? And I didn't know. I didn't have anything planned. I know I talked, I spoke to Brooke about it and she already had, she had loads of plans. She was like, right, I'm going to do, I'm going to do an album. I'm going to go travel. I'm going to do um, a few different things. So she was, she had a, a really good uh, post Eurovision kind of plan, but I didn't. Mm-hmm. And I definitely like felt the blues of that, like the post Eurovision blues. And um, it took me a while to like really come back down to earth and be like, all right, I need to do something else now. I need to, you know, figure out a new project or um, yeah, just go do something new. So yeah, like right after Eurovision, there's no real aftercare. It's just like, all right, you did that now. Well done. Thanks. Done. Goodbye. See you later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know. God. And on that note, what advice? Like I know we've touched on a lot of interesting things you've said but if you were speaking to an Irish artist now say this year going what advice would you give them um I don't know you know people always say oh just you know enjoy it do your best and like have a good time and but I really don't know like what advice I would give um stick to your guns like stick to your gut if you think you Mm. should do something your way like then do it your way and um believe in yourself I think would be a really important aspect of it like believe that you can do well in it um, and that power of the positivity which should should help you out and, and push you forward through it that would be it I think mm-hmm. I love the fact you said uh, you know that you love still being part of the Eurovision community and mm. we said it so much last year talking to the acts that it's so important how you leave the Eurovision community once your experience is over and mm. you know you're always part of it but the perception of you is so important afterwards because like you said years and years after you can still be invited back to events and fans love you yeah um it's just the whole fan experience how have you found that you could you know we're what is it four years five years on do you still feel as much love as you did back then or is 100%. it has it grown? Ah, 100%. Especially considered like you're still the only act for us to qualify. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think like um, definitely I felt it in Liverpool. Like the Eurovision fans, no matter where you go, no matter what you do, they all just want to like share you with love and 
you know, get a picture, you know, say hi, ask you the question they've been wanting to ask you for the last few years. Um, there's so much positivity in the Eurovision family that I come home from these events just feeling like completely full, like my cup is full. Like, um, so yeah, the perception I think is the, the exact same as the day I stepped on to the semi final stage and, you know, represent the country. I think people still kind of see that when, when they see me at events and stuff like that. Um, and I love chatting with different Eurovision fans at these things and like asking them the questions you're asking me, like, what do you think we can do different? Yeah. Like, um, and just getting their opinions on things. And again, a lot of the time when I say this, they say, you need to get rid of your national contest yeah. <laughs> and, you know, get, take it internally again. So would you have done your song if that was the no. selection? No, no, I wouldn't have done that. Fair just enough. I just I just don't think it's um, I just just think it's 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 for me. Um, and not even just the risk of not getting through it. It's just I don't like the visual of it. It's not very uh, appealing. So unfortunately, I, I wouldn't. But if it was an internal process. Like I, I wrote a song a few years back um, for the Eurovision called Belong. And I haven't released it yet because um, I th- I do still think it could be a good song for us. And I know you can't go on with a song you've already released. So every time I listen to it, or every time I sit at piano and play it, I'm like, yeah, like we should just we should just bring this, just try this and see how that goes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm. Um, that leads I, me on to my next question: Would you come back <laughs> ever? I'd love to. I really mm. would. Um, like I don't know. So I'm like 31 now and I was like 26 at the time. Um, oh, you need so much energy for that. And mm. it's only gotten kind of busier, I think, yeah. in the last three, four More years. The amount of pre-parties and everything. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah, serious stamina needed. Yeah, so I don't know. I'd I'd really have to think about whether it'd be good for my health. <laughs> but... <laughs> But um, oh, but, you can always tap in and out though, Ryan. Like I know, you well, that's one it. Thing, not go to the other. Well, yeah, that's we don't it. want to discourage you from. Yeah, going. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I would, I would love to go back. I would. Is it a case of like, would you, if you say like that, wanted to go with that song or had the right song and felt really strongly about it, would you approach the broadcast or T and just pitch it and yeah, hopefully go internally? Is that well? That's that was the idea for the last few years. You know, I've sent in. Um, this song in particular and with a little bit of a plan as well like the storyboard that um, that I was talking about so I have an idea in my head of how it might look or how it might come across and yeah maybe maybe it's not for another few years or maybe when the time is right it might be a good time maybe it's not the same song maybe it's a different song but but yeah I do really like this song I think it would be think would be good so you're hanging on to it for the moment well yeah yeah I am you know and I wrote it with I actually wrote it with Eurovision in mind at the time I think I wrote it the year after I got back and it all poured out fairly easily and quickly and yeah I think it could be really nice amazing speaking of your further involvement with Eurovision obviously after your participation junior Eurovision yeah you were around for Taylor Hines IOU yeah. the music video we actually oh, no. met Neve Kavanagh in here <laughs> I I love that whole thing for all the wrong reasons yeah, um, yeah, yeah. we had Neve Kavanagh um, in here with us a few months ago and she just was bursting with joy about uh, Junior Eurovision what has your experience been with that with TG Cahar Neve is great so Neve has like this sheet of all her Irish <laughs> she uh, brought it in for she, us she, she brought it yeah. in for I, I might I might be getting it in the future. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I needed it. So like, she gave a copy to one of the girls, and I never even thought about asking her for a copy. But every time I go in to do the jury on the the Junior Eurovision, I start to have like a mini panic attack <laughs> because I know I'm gonna have to say like two words in Irish <laughs> before it comes across. And oh, I was never good at Irish in school. I always had like this idea that I'll never be good at it, and I, you know. You know when you you think you you won't be good at something you never will be. Yeah. So I oh I always panic going in for that. But then when I was asked to do the IOU video with Neve, uh, I was like, well Neve's doing it. It'll be a bit of crack. It'll be a bit of fun. And I remember the whole time, just being like, what am I doing here? <laughs> what am I doing here? And then when I watched it, 
Oh God! I actually I I, I deleted that part of my my memory. Out. I'm so sorry. And Lou's brought her right back up. Well, I, right back I love it. I love it. The fact that yourself and Neve are the parents, oh, but like so you could be her son. It's so ridiculous, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I I really enjoy doing it every every year when I get the call. I'm like, yeah, you know, let's go in and 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 do the jury, junior Eurovision. But I think um, I think it's a really important part of Ireland's Eurovision to have a really strong junior Eurovision because that's the next generation coming through of singers and stuff like that so so yeah it's it's nice to be a part of it do you follow it closely I don't really follow it closely no I I I go in I listen to the to the different singers the day I'm in for the junior Eurovision stuff and and I I don't really have a telly at home as well so I wouldn't I wouldn't watch it but I always get a call off my nana every year being like oh you're on the telly you're doing (laughs) Junior Eurovision again so yeah can always count on an Irish granny to update you on those (laughs) things yeah exactly (laughs) a lot of fans would say that the junior selection is kind of everything that we should be doing and the support that they get and the the results really you know they haven't been amazing but like last year we came fourth and mm. we're, we have an identity and I remember you in one of your tweets you were saying that we have a language and we have a culture and we, yeah. we need to showcase the world that yeah um, can you just talk us a bit more about that like what what would be kind of the like we like we haven't we haven't been doing great you know so why not just like try something different mm-hmm. again just mix it up get like an Irish an Irish act Osquelga, like the Merry Wallopers or the Scratch or Lancome or something like authentically Irish to just just send them over. Get mm. them just any of their songs. Just, just do that. Um, I actually wanted the scratch to do it one year, and I, I, I linked them up for a meeting in RTE, and they actually decided themselves. Ah, I don't think this is for us. But it, w- it was. It you was, link it up? Yeah. You're like a mini had a but it was, but it was really close. Um, and, oh god. And uh, yeah, I would have loved to see that happen because I love the scratch. That's gonna blow some people's minds. Yeah. I think. Oh my goodness, yeah. they're amazing. Have you seen them live? I haven't. No. Ah, they're Loved deadly. Him. They're really good live, yeah. And then you got Ryan Kelly, the legs, who comes out and like tap dances yeah. and the crowd goes mad. <laughs> yeah. Like, if we just did something like that, it's that's, oh, I'm like, oh yeah, that must be Ireland. You know, it's recognisable no that that's Ireland. No one else has that identity. No. Mm-hmm. You know, so. You, you go into the church in town like any weekday night, they have the Irish dancers and the tourists are just yeah. enthralled and yeah. we like I think as Irish people we kind of see it and we go oh, oh yeah like there's the Irish dancers but we maybe take it for granted that that's really incredible art to other people there's mm. a certain expectancy with you know the image of your country and particularly at, at a contest like Eurovision you know you tune in you oh that's Ireland like you said or mm. you know you tune in oh that's Australia that's you know yeah. mm. Portuguese you know entry oh I can Port tell that straight really off yeah. That. yeah they, yeah. Like, they don't care yeah. what the song's like it's just that's their identity and they stick with it yeah and they're that's... not trying to be American no you know no and I think a lot of a lot of acts are like really American like this American style like Katy Perry or like you know kind of modelled off American acts in yeah. a way and we've done that a little bit in our past too you know so yeah we we have something that's unique to us just use it that's that's my opinion yeah. definitely for anyone who wants it <laughs> <laughs> we definitely need a shock to the system I think yeah. you know yeah, to kind of wake, wake, wake us up a bit at Eurovision because yeah. we're we're sleeping beast I feel would yeah. you guys do it as a duo <laughs> if we could sing <laughs> I need some terrible Irish rapping or something. Oh Jesus! It could be God. like a three-minute podcast, but like you know, it'd be really a really well-written like. You so know, we're not going to sing ranting. a song, but we're here to tell you why you should vote for us. A That's little bit like one. a rap, yeah. <laughs> Will you produce it, please? Yeah, <laughs> I'll have to think about it. Okay, okay. There'll okay. be gas. Oh my God. Um. So, post your vision, what have you got planned? You know, what's coming up for you in the future? Obviously, a new year, twenty twenty-four. Yeah. What What are you up to? Um. So. My next thing is I'm actually going away in my camper van for a few months and I'm going to travel around Europe. So like Deadly. aside from music and work and stuff like that, I think it's really important just to like enjoy life mm. in general. So I really try to have a lifestyle that like is like 50-50 work and and fun. So and I and come here I enjoy my work too. So um that's the next thing for me. I'm just focused on so I have a camper that I converted and yeah. I'm just focusing on like fixing some stuff in it and, and stuff of like that and then heading off in a few weeks time. 
so that's what I have in the in the meantime and then I haven't too many long term plans whatever happens happens and I'm you know not too not too future focused trying to be a little bit more present amazing live in the moment trying my best you know and you'll be going around Europe in your camper van and there'll be someone in Moldova going yeah is yeah that, is that the Irish <laughs> yeah, guy yeah, yeah yeah exactly yeah <laughs> who knows like stranger things have happened yeah stranger things have would happened. you do any writing while you're traveling or yeah like I'm always writing and I'm always like tickling that creative uh, side or like making videos or whatever it is doing something creative um, so yeah I'll have my guitar with me and maybe I'll play a few gigs away um, but yeah just kind of take it as it comes amazing yeah and where can people find you if they want to keep in touch and follow your journey um i suppose instagram um at ryan underscore acoustic and uh, i might just i might put some videos up on youtube or stuff like that um and if anyone want, does want to get in touch it's through instagram um yeah so that's or, or through my email which is on my instagram so that's it brilliant Amazing. well Ryan thank you so so much for joining us it was thank great you. to speak with you and meet you again um, best of luck with your with your travels and uh, maybe see you on the Eurovision stage in the future again who knows, who knows? and it was uh, great to hang out with you guys I really appreciate the work you do for for Irish Eurovision which is really important um, and hopefully see you again soon thanks Ryan thank you so much thank yeah. you very much thank you oh, yeah.